Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about voyages to the unknown, a prince of India, war and murder, shipwreck and heartbreak, and a most faithful son. We're going to follow that outline right up above my head, and we're going to talk about Christopher Columbus. And which of these two incredibly divergent narratives is the more accurate? And we're going to use the historical record to do that. And we're going to use the historical record to answer that question right there. Was Christopher Columbus an intrepid explorer who discovered America, or a genocidal conqueror responsible for theft, slavery, and genocide? Use the information from this lecture to build and support a thesis that argues one way or another, or create a third. And finally, should Columbus Day actually be celebrated? Now, in terms of evaluating the documents from the historical record, uh, historiography uh, plays an enormous role in this. Judging which texts are valid and which texts aren't, which texts support your reconstruction of events, which do not, uh, which contradict it, which texts are believable, and which texts are complete and total lies. And uh, for the next, for this lecture, for this debate we're talking about right here, there's really four texts that feature really, really prominently. And I'm going to blitz through them right now, uh, but know that these texts are going to pop up much later on. This is Bartolomo de las Casas, uh, the letter of Michel de Cuneo, the letter of Francisco Bobadilla, and the life of the admiral uh, written by Ferdinand Columbus. Now, we left off with these two different ideas about the way the world looks. The Portuguese school of navigation said that that is the world. The world is a big world with a huge ocean between Europe and the lands of the Indies. Uh, Columbus and his faction argued that the world looked like that. It was a small world with a small ocean that only ha you could cross this ocean in 40 days of voyage. Now, of course, you know, in the real world, uh, neither of these images is actually correct. Neither of these views of the world is, is technically correct. Columbus's is really wrong because he got the shape of the world wrong, got the, got the, the size of the world wrong. Uh, but the Portuguese one isn't exactly accurate either. They, they were accurate in the size of the world, but not that there was a huge ocean because they didn't know there was like a big continent in between Europe uh, and, and Asia. But it doesn't matter. Christopher Columbus convinces the dual monarchs of Spain to support him. He convinces them that if he sails from the islands of the Azores, you know, west, that in about 40 days, he can reach the island of Chipangu, which is, of course, modern day Japan. And he makes all sorts of promises. He says, look, I can reach the lands of the Indies in 40 days. I can be back in another 40 days. I can bring silk. I can bring cardamom. I can bring sugar. I can bring cotton. I can bring all of these amazing things back from Asia. I can bring enormous wealth to this newly founded kingdom of Spain. And the monarchs of Spain agree to fund him. They're like, look, he's probably not right, but you know, even if he's e even if he is right, you know, you know, let's just take that chance. Let's see if he's correct. And they agree to fund him. And Columbus climbs in three boats, three little caravels, these these explore these little tough little ships of the time. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, and he sails west. Uh, think convinced that in 40 days he's going to find Chipangu. And he, he does this. Uh, Columbus sails the ocean blue, 1492. And on the 36th day of sailing west, he finds land. October 12th, 1492. Christopher Columbus, that's, that's actually not Christopher Columbus, but Christopher Columbus lands on the islands of the Caribbean. And he declares these to be the West Indies. He has found, according to Christopher Columbus, he has found the land of the Indies. He's found a way to China and Japan. He's just got to find China and Japan first. He's going to become Marco Polo, the new Marco Polo. Now, this feat, crossing the middle of the Atlantic in 36 days, this has to be given to Christopher Columbus. Regardless of what your opinion of Columbus is, uh, this is an act of complete and total genius, keeping three tiny ships on course for 36 days with no real idea of what you were going to find at the end, knowing you only had about 50 or 60 days of food and water. And the 
absolute genius of Columbus is manifest. He is a truly gifted navigator. Even the really ferocious critics of Columbus give him this. He knew what he was doing. He kept these little ships on course. He crossed the ocean in an act of incredible bravery and self-confidence, absolutely assured that he was going to find the lands of the Indies. But instead, he finds the people of the Caribbean. And uh, there's a map of the Caribbean world as Christopher Columbus discovered it. Christopher Columbus is absolutely convinced that he's found Japan. He's convinced he's found Chipangu. He knows that China's just got to be over the horizon and India's just got to be over there. And that means that the Spice Islands have to be down there. He's absolutely convinced of this. So he meets the Taino. He asks them if they know the emperor of China. He asks them if they know the way to Japan. And these guys, of course, don't know anything about this. Um, he bumps into the group of people called the Taino. And the deal with the Taino is the Taino were the larger people. They were the Native Americans of the Caribbean islands. And, and there they are on the lower left. But at, at the time that Christopher Columbus shows up, the Taino are actually fighting a war with another group of people called the Carib. And uh, the Taino are actually losing this war. Uh, the Carib, as you can see in the uh, southeast islands of the Caribbean, are actually pushing the Taino out of from island to island to island. So this is where historiography comes into play. When Columbus bumps into the Taino, the Taino welcome Columbus. They, they're looking at these like really odd looking guys. And they're like, hey, guys, um, I bet these guys would really be useful helping to fight the Carib. So the Taino portray themselves as peaceful, gentle, loving, generous people. We're nothing at all like those hideous, horrible Caribs. And Christopher Columbus is like, who are, who are the Carib? And the Taino go, oh, we're gonna tell you all about the Carib. The Carib are these vicious, bat-eared savages who eat people. And Christopher Columbus is writing all of this down. Uh, so this is why we have these modern images of the Taino as these peaceful, beautific people who love peace. And they're just like, like little children. And they were, they were being beaten and eaten by the hideous bat-eared Caribs. This is the story that the Taino are telling Columbus. And Columbus is writing all of this down. But Columbus keeps asking them, like, where Japan is. He keeps asking them, like, where, where can I meet Kublai Khan? Because I want to be like Marco Polo. Uh, and he writes all of this down. And he takes some birds and he takes a few, a few Taino back with him. He loads them on his boat because one of the things he does know is that these islands are filled with people. There's no silk or cinnamon or cardamom and there's definitely not any gold because um, he's promised all of that to the kings of Spain, the king and queen of Spain. So he takes these guys back and he is absolutely convinced that he has found the lands of the Indies and he sails back on his way back to Spain. And uh, irony of ironies, he's actually blown off course on his on his return voyage uh, from the first voyage and actually ends up landing in Lisbon where he just basically shows off to all the people who thought he was wrong. He's like, you thought with your stupid model about the big earth and you made fun of me with my model about the little earth. You said all my math was wrong, but I found the Indies and you did it. You're still building stupid little castles along the coast of Africa. And the, the, the Portuguese just kind of give him this look and they're like, what is he talking about? The earth is the earth. But Columbus makes it back to Spain. He lands in Seville. He is greeted in triumph at the court of the dual monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella. And he says, I have sailed west. I have proven that the earth is small with a little ocean. And in 36 days, I reached the islands off the coast of Asia. I've reached Chipangu. And, and it's only a matter of time before I find China and the court of the Khan and come back with all silk and cardamom and sugar and coffee and all of porcelain and all of this crazy stuff from Asia. And the, the king and queen of Spain are absolutely overjoyed. They give Columbus all of this stuff. And this is, this is going to be important later on. They shower him with titles and privileges. Columbus is named the Lord Admiral of the Oceans, and he is given vast powers to do what he wants in these 
lands that he's discovered. They load him up with more stuff, and he sails west. This is the second and the second and the third voyage of Columbus. Uh, you can see it in the map right up above my head. As he sails to the west, intent, he like brings people with him that like speak Chinese. He brings people with him that speak Malaysian because he's going to go down to the Spice Islands. He's going to meet the emperor of China. Columbus is very, very excited, and he sails to the west. He returns uh, on the second expedition, and starting in 1493, Columbus starts to set up a series of, of colonies along these islands of Hispaniola, along the islands of the Caribbean. And the point of these colonies is going to be a place for ships to stop, resupply, and then they can sail on to China. They can sail on to Japan. And he says, well, we have to be able to fund this stuff. And he notices that the Taino do actually have a little bit of gold. So he says, uh, you guys should give this gold to us because it's going gonna, it's gonna to fund the expedition. It's going to fund when we talk uh, to the emperor of China. It's going to fund when we finally get to the Spice Islands. And the Taino are like, okay, uh, you know, there are some pretty advanced people to the West, but I guess that's, that's what they're talking about. But the problem is, is that throughout Columbus's second and third voyage, he keeps sailing around the Caribbean and, and there's no China. Uh, there's no Spice Islands. He's sailing around. He's asking people where the court of the great emperor is. They don't know where it is. He says, uh, well, we, we, just need to, we just need silk, cardamom, uh, sugar, saffron. And uh, the natives in the areas, the Indios, are, are just kind of looking at him going, we don't, we don't know what any of that is. So Columbus is getting really desperate. And Columbus is not really sort of taking care of these colonies that he's setting up uh, on the islands of the Caribbean, most notably on the island of Hispaniola. And Columbus's colonies very rapidly descend into these really squalid, really poorly run settlements. A lot of people showed up wanting to get in on this trade with Asia. And there's no trade with Asia going on. And there's no silk. There's no spices. There's no ships full of silk coming from the Indies. Columbus keeps returning to Spain. And the Spanish monarchs are like... Where's all this stuff you promised, Columbus? You know, where's these ships full of silk and these ships full of porcelain and all this cool stuff we want? You just keep bringing us back like bewildered Indios and like parrots. Like, like make with the money, Columbus. You promised all this stuff. Columbus is starting to get desperate. And to make Columbus look even worse, uh, only five years after he crosses the Atlantic, the Portuguese finish their great project. Under the Portuguese admiral, Vasco da Gama, he finally circumnavigates Africa. The Portuguese finish this enormous task. They build all these castles along the coast of Africa. You can see the, the voyages of the Portuguese uh, merchants and discoverers. They finally find the end of Africa, a place that they call the Cape of Good Hope because they're like, no good things are going to come because they're going to finish the project of the great project of Portugal. And Vasco da Gama says, look, we're on our way to Asia, but we're not going to send one or two or three little ships. We're going to send like 30 ships. So Vasco da Gama commands this fleet, this fleet which goes around uh, Africa, sails up the Indian Ocean, and lands in Calicut, which is modern-day Calcutta, where they meet the Prince of India, the, the, the Raj of Calicut. And they meet him, and they're very happy, and, you know, because the, the, the Indians are, like, not real happy with the Ottoman Turks either, uh, and they exchange goods. And then, you know, there's no question about Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama is clearly in India. You know, they've got turbans, they've got Ganesh, they've got curry, they've got vindaloo, they've got cotton, they've got sugar. They've got all of this great stuff. So there's no, no question that Vasco da Gama is in India. You know, they're wearing turbans. Uh, and Vasco da Gama buys all of this great stuff. He enters into this trading relationship with the, with the, with the Raj of Calicut, with the Prince of India. And they load all this cool stuff onto his ships. And Vasco da Gama returns to Portugal. And the return on the sale of these spices from India, the sale of curries and sugar and cotton and all of this incredible stuff from India is so wealthy that it basically pays the national budget of the Kingdom of Portugal for three years. That's the return on this one voyage from India. And it is the first of many voyages to India. Portugal explodes. Portugal goes from this tiny little kingdom on the edge of Europe 
to one of the most prosperous and wealthy places, not just in Europe, but in the world. And they've done it because they finished literally this like 60 year project launched by Prince Henry the Navigator. And the whole time Vasco da Gama's showing up with all this incredible stuff from India. You know, the King and Queen of Spain are looking at Columbus going, what you, you, that's what you promised us Columbus. And instead you keep bringing back these confused Indians and like parrots and like strange plants. Where's, where's the stuff, Columbus? Where's the stuff? But the thing is, is that the return of da Gama sets up a conundrum within the Portuguese school of navigation. They're like, okay, okay, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Columbus went out across the ocean 36 days and found what he claims is the land of the Indies. Vasco da Gama sailed around Africa and landed in Calcutta. He's, he's in India. But both of these guys are using very different models of the world. You can't have two different sizes to the planet. Either Columbus is correct, and it's a small world, or da Gama is correct, and it's a big world. They both can't be correct. So this, is, this creates a conundrum uh, that the Portuguese School of Navigation wants to fix. And to, to, to solve this idea, who is right, Columbus uh, or da Gama, they hire uh, one of Columbus's old sailors, a man named Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, Amerigo Vespucci is another Italian, and he's hired by the King of Portugal. And uh, they're like, look, we want you to sail to the West because you sailed uh, with Columbus. So we want you to sail to the West and like figure out exactly what Columbus found. Columbus says he's found the Indies. He's found the lands of the Indies. Uh, but like da Gama found the Indies. I mean, he's clearly talking with these guys in India. So you are going to sail west and figure out exactly what Columbus found. And Vespucci says, I'll do it. So uh, they, give him a, they give him a series of boats and uh, Vespucci proceeds to sail to the west, sailing around the islands of the Caribbean, sailing up and down what, what is today the coast of Brazil for Portugal. And this is why they speak Portuguese in Brazil. And uh, Amerigo Vespucci returns and he writes a series of letters describing his voyages. And this is the very famous letters of Amerigo Vespucci. And in this letter, he says, look, Columbus did not find the lands of the Indies. This is what Columbus found. And this is what Amerigo uh, Vespucci says. In past days, I wrote very fully to you of my return from the new countries, which have been found and explored with the ships at the cost and by the command of the most serene king of Portugal, and it is lawful to call it a new world, because none of these uh, countries were known to our ancestors, and to all who hear about them, they will be entirely new. This is what Vespucci returns with. Vespucci says Columbus did not find the land of the Indies. He found a new world. Columbus very maturely reacts to this information by calling Amerigo Vespucci a damned liar. Columbus found the Indies. Uh, and this is why the New World is not named after Columbus, but instead is named after Amerigo Vespucci. The tradition at the time was to name land masses in Latin. So if you take Americo and turn it into Latin, it becomes Americus. And in, in the Latin language, all land is feminine. So that's how you go from Americus to America. So Amerigo Vespucci is uh, the lands of America are named after Amerigo Vespucci, who captained a vessel. He was a captain, so there is your original Captain America right there on the left. He's, he's Amerigo Vespucci. Back in Columbus's colony, things go from bad, they were already bad back in 1493, to worse. Things just keep getting worse in Columbus's colony. He's still looking for China. He's still looking for Japan. He doesn't find them. To help him run these colonies, he brings in a bunch of people that he trusts because he doesn't exactly trust these, these Spanish from Castile. He brings his brothers over. He brings in a bunch of friends from Italy. He gets a bunch of Spanish guys who, uh, who, are, uh, who can help him. And very rapidly in this kind of dirty, squalid little colony of Columbus, these two factions develop and then proceed to basically tear each other to pieces. Factions rapidly develop in the colonies, pitting the Italians who side with Columbus, even the Spanish who side with Columbus are called Italians, so you have the faction of the Italians versus the faction of the Castilians because they're from the Castile region of Spain. 
And these two colonies are, I mean, these colonies are constantly on the verge of rebellion as these two factions are constantly struggling against one another. The Italians go, well, we're on the side of Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus is the Lord Admiral. He was given power by the King and Queen of Spain. So we are being faithful to what we've been ordered to do. Whereas the Castilians are a bunch of noblemen from Spain. And they're like, we were lured here by the promise of silk and gold and trade with China. We haven't even found China yet. And anyway, this is a Spanish colony. Why are these Italians in charge of a Spanish colony? And not even Italian nobles, just a bunch of commoners from Italy. So these colonies are constantly on the verge of rebellion and understanding the really, really ugly factionalism of these early colonies is key to understanding the historiography of the documents. So they're constantly on the verge of rebellion. The Castilians want to throw out the Italians. The Italians want to throw out the Castilians. They're completely out of money because they, they borrowed all this money expecting trade with China. They're, they're out of money. Columbus and his brothers say, we got to make money for these colonies. We have to show something to the king and queen of Spain. So they turn to large scale slave raiding across the islands of the Caribbean. And that's what they start to do. And to explain what he does, Columbus writes a letter to the sovereigns, those two, those dual monarchs back in Spain. And this is, this is Columbus's letter to the sovereigns in 1498. And this is what he says. Uh, you know, he says, I haven't found silk, I haven't found China, I haven't found porcelain. But from here, one might send, in the name of the Holy Trinity, as many slaves as could be sold, as well as a quantity of Brazil. That's a type of tree. If the information I have is correct, it appears that we could sell 4,000 slaves who might be worth 20 millions or more. And this is what Christopher Columbus starts to do. He starts to attack the Taino. He starts to attack the Carib, dragging them into his ships and then sailing them and selling them in the slave markets of North Africa, selling them in the slave markets of Spain. And he starts to make money off of this. But this is a really ugly trade. And the Castilians do not actually like what's going on. They view the idea of, of selling people, you know, to the Muslims in Africa as completely awful. But this is what Columbus is doing. And it does start to turn a profit for Columbus's squalid little colonies. And it can fund Columbus's continued search for China and Japan and the Spice Islands, which he knows, he knows they're right out there. He knows he's going to find them. And in the middle of all these slave raidings, uh, is a, is comes uh, the letter of Michel de Cuneo. Now, uh, a lot of students hear Michel and they think it's a woman, but Michel is a guy. He's an Italian. So Michel de Cuneo writes a letter. And Michel de Cuneo is an Italian. He's part of this Italian faction. And he's helping Columbus raid for slaves across the Caribbean. And he writes this letter back to his friends in Italy. And, and that's what he writes in the letter right up above. He has this, this incident that takes place. And this is why you have this modern accusation of rape against Christopher Columbus. Because this is what Michel de Cuneo writes. Uh, while I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman whom the said Lord Admiral gave to me. That's Christopher Columbus. When I had taken her back to my cabin, she was naked as was their custom. I was filled with a desire to take my pleasure with her and attempted to satisfy my desire. She was unwilling and so treated me with her nails that I wished I had never begun. But to cut a long story short, I took a piece of rope and whipped her so soundly and she let forth such terrible screams as you would not have believed your ears. Eventually we came to terms, I assure you. And we came to such terms that you would have thought she had been brought up in a school for whores. That is Cuneo's letter on the second voyage of Columbus, written 1495. So basically Christopher Columbus enslaves a woman, gives her to de Cuneo to rape, and de Cuneo rapes her. So here's the question about the letter of Michel de Cuneo. Can this letter be believed? The people who really hate Columbus say yes. I mean, this is Michel de Cuneo. He's writing a letter to his friends back in Italy. This was never a letter meant to be publicly read or, or circulated widely. So yeah, why would Michel de Cuneo lie to his friends back in Italy about like what he's doing in the New World? The defenders of Columbus say that you cannot believe Michel de Cuneo's letter uh, for exactly the same reason. This is a young man doing very ugly, very dirty, very backbreaking work in the New World, basically just kind of bragging to his buddies back in Italy, like, 
how great Christopher Columbus is and like how much sex he's having in the new world. Uh, because if there's one thing young men lie about more often than anything else, it's sex. So the, the defenders of Columbus say that Michel de Cuneo's letter is just a young man bragging, whereas the critics of Columbus argue that it is a factual account of sexual violence in the New World. This is why the historiography of these documents uh, becomes really important. Can Michel de Cuneo be believed? Is he describing actual events or is he making things up? Does the author have ulterior motives? Is he telling the truth or is he bragging to his buddies back in Italy? Now, a key to evaluating different historical texts is the question of do different documents agree on the same set of events? So if you've got two or three different documents, if they agree that the same things happened, then you can assure that these things actually, there's some veracity to it. These things actually happened. But if one person is lying, it's very rare that somebody else is going to share and tell uh, this same lie. Which brings us to Bartolomo de las Casas. Now, de las Casas is a really interesting figure, uh, and he does have very distinct ulterior motives. Bartolomo de las Casas, uh, he emigrates to America in 1502, and he comes with his father, and he is one of these sort of Spanish conquerors in the Caribbean. He lands in Cuba. He does this slave raiding in Cuba. Uh, he starts attacking the Carib and the Taino and dragging them to the ships to sell for slaves or to labor on the Spanish plantations. But after doing this for about 12 years, uh, Bartolomo de las Casas like has this profound religious experience. And he basically breaks down and, and, and admits that everything he's doing has been incredibly sinful and wrong. And he, he, he has to, he decides that the only way he can save his soul is to completely repent. So he gives away all his wealth, he frees his slaves, he gives away his land, and he has this religious conversion. And so profound is the religious conversion of Bartolomo de las Casas that he actually joins the order of the Dominicans in 1522. He becomes a Dominican friar. And that's him right up above. And Bartolomo de las Casas writes a book about the destruction that he witnessed uh, throughout the Caribbean. And there's the book uh, at, in its modern title, A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies. And Bartolomo de las Casas recounts the terrible things that the Spanish are doing in the Caribbean. Indian villages will rebel and their chiefs will be dragged and crucified. Uh, there is a tax on gold. The Taino have to give gold and silver to the Spanish. And if they refuse, the Spanish cut off their noses, chop off their hands. And that's an illustration from one of the publications of his book right there. The Indians who fight, the Indians who stand and fight against being raided for slaves are beaten, they're killed, they're fed to dogs, all right? And Bartolomo de las Casas comes to the conclusion that the Spanish cannot be trusted in the new world, that the only thing, the only thing that can protect the people of the new world is Holy Mother Church. Only the Catholic Church has the power and the wisdom to explore the new world. And this is what Bartolomo de las Casas dedicates the rest of his life to doing. He becomes the great defender of the Indians, and he becomes a, a great convert. He starts converting large number of Native Americans to the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is the only thing that can protect them from that right up above. And uh, De Las Casas' book is, is, is a hard read. And one of the things that De Las Casas really takes the Spanish to task for is that, even though he is Spanish, uh, is that uh, in Catholic law, you cannot enslave a fellow Christian. So the Spanish actually prevent the Catholic missionaries from proselytizing to the Native Americans. Uh, so he's, he's saying that they're not only killing these people and feeding them to dogs and cutting off their hands and noses, they're preventing the church from saving their souls. And Bartolomo de las Casas uh, works against the Spanish kingdom and in favor of the Catholic church to spread the power of the Catholic church in the Caribbean. So he describes the initial contact, he describes the histories uh, and what's been going on in the Caribbean. Can de las Casas be entirely trusted? That's an open question. Does de las Casas have an ulterior motive? And the answer is yes. His ulterior motive is to put the Catholic Church in charge of the New World. 
Uh, also, when De Las Casas writes about the Lord Admiral, when he writes about Christopher Columbus, one of the things you have to understand is De Las Casas is not present in the New World when Christopher Columbus is. Christopher Columbus is gone from the New World by 1500. De Las Casas only arrives in the New World in 1502, and he doesn't really have his big religious conversion, you know, for 12 years later. And he's, by the time he actually writes of these events, you know, it's been 20, 25 years since Columbus was there. So when De Las Casas criticizes the Spanish and he criticizes Columbus, he's writing about stuff that happened 20, you know, almost 30 years ago. He's not a contemporary of Columbus. He's relying on what other people are telling him about Columbus and what he saw happened after Columbus left. But it doesn't matter because De Las Casas is writing about rumors that are getting back to the king and queen of Spain. And they don't like what they're hearing about the new world. They were promised silk. They were promised cardamom, cinnamon, sugar, cotton, porcelain. And they're hearing about slavery and death and war and murder and people being fed to dogs. They're like, this is crazy. What is going on under Christopher Columbus? So they decide to send someone to figure out the truth of what's going on in these colonies. And his name is Francisco de Bobadilla. Uh, so they're alarmed at these rumors. Uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella send Francisco de Bobadilla, who is a Spanish noble, who knows a lot of the people in that kind of Castilian faction in the New World. In 1500, he, la he lands to sort of survey all this crazy stuff that's going on uh, in the Caribbean. And Bobadilla, according to his own account, Bobadilla is so incredibly shocked by what he finds. Bobadilla writes about, like, he lands in the colony to find body parts nailed to windows and doors. There had just been a rebellion against the Columbus brothers, and they had taken the rebels, chopped their bodies up, and nailed them to the various houses across this colony. And Bobadilla was like, what the hell is going on here? Bobadilla says, this is, this is, this is outrageous. This is far worse according to Bobadilla. This is far worse than anything I was led to expect. Where's Columbus? Where's Christopher Columbus at? And they bring Christopher Columbus. He says, oh, I'm, oh you are Francisco. You're the inspector from, from Spain. And Francisco Bobadilla points his finger at Columbus and says, arrest that guy. Uh, he orders the arrest of Christopher Columbus. He orders the arrest of uh, the Columbus brothers. He orders the arrest of most of the Italian faction, even though he doesn't technically have the authority to do this. Columbus and his brothers are locked in chains. They're sent in the bottom of a ship and they are sent back to Spain in complete disgrace. And then Bobadilla has to kind of rationalize his arrest of Christopher Columbus because he doesn't actually have the authority to do this. And he does this in a long 48 page letter. He writes 48 pages. Uh, and there's an image of his letter right up there detailing like what he saw in the new world. And he's having to try and explain why he went beyond his royal authority to arrest Christopher Columbus. Now, uh, this letter, we know this letter existed for many, many years. And the letter went back to Spain, and the letter details all of this incredibly crazy stuff that we're going to cover. But the letter kind of vanished in the 16th century. And even though other historians wrote about Bobadilla's letter, uh, nobody actually had a copy of the letter itself until 2006, some 500 years after the letter was written, uh, the letter is rediscovered in an archive in Valladolid in Spain, and it's rediscovered in the year 2006. Uh, and it, it details all of the charges that Bobadilla laid against Christopher Columbus to justify his arrest of the Italians in the New World. And this is, this is what Bobadilla says Columbus is doing. This is why Bobadilla arrested Columbus. One, cutting off of noses and ears is for minor punishment. Steal a loaf of bread, cut off your hand. Speak about, speak nasty about the Columbus brothers, cut off your tongue. You know, don't go to church on time, cut off your nose. Uh, Columbus prevents missionary work among the Indians. He prevents Indian uh, conversion. He prevents uh, Catholic missionaries from proselytizing to the Indians because, of course, you can't enslave fellow Christians under Catholic law cutting out the tongue of critics. And a lot of the women of the Castilian faction would speak nasty about Columbus. Columbus ordered a woman's uh, tongue to be torn out of her mouth. This wasn't an Indian woman either. This was a Spanish woman. Selling girls as young as nine or 10 into sexual slavery, giving young women to his, his fellow Italians uh, to rape. 
This is what Bobadilla says. He says they're capturing these Indian girls as young as nine or 10, selling them into sexual slavery in Morocco. Uh, immolation as punishment. If you rebel against Columbus, he'll hang you and set you on fire. Uh, large scale slave raids into the interior of the islands, a native tax uh, where basically the Taino have to bring a small bag of gold. And if they don't have that bag of gold, Columbus orders their noses cut off and their hands cut off. Uh, so here's the question about Bobadilla. Can we actually believe Francisco de Bobadilla? Or is Bobadilla lying? Can Bobadilla be believed? Did he exaggerate? Did he just make this stuff up? Did Bobadilla have ulterior motives? And the answer is yes. Bobadilla is friends with the Castilian faction in the New World. He knows these guys. He is a Spanish noble. He doesn't like the idea of Italians running a Spanish colony. And once Bobadilla arrived in the New World, we know that the Castilians promised Bobadilla that if he got rid of Columbus, he would become governor of the New World. And we know this because after the arrest of Christopher Columbus, Francisco de Bobadilla becomes the governor of the New World. Uh, he doesn't last for very long, though. Uh, he's only governor for two years. So Bobadilla has an ulterior motive. He does profit from the arrest of Christopher Columbus. But here's the key. This is how you tell whether Bobadilla is making things up or telling the truth. Are there other texts that agree with the letter of Bobadilla? Does Michel de Cuneo agree or disagree with Bobadilla? Does de las Casas agree or disagree with Bobadilla? Does the writing of Columbus himself agree or disagree with the charges of Francisco de Bobadilla? Critics of Columbus say, yeah, Bobadilla is telling the truth. Defenders of Columbus say that Bobadilla is lying because he wanted to be governor of the New World. And one of the things in support, one of the things that actually helps Columbus's case is the fact that after the arrest of Columbus, like what changed after the arrest of Columbus? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Uh, Bobadilla actually tried to stem the attacks on the Taino and the Carib, utterly failed. And actually the Castilian faction expels Bobadilla uh, from the New World in 1502. He tries to return to Spain, but there's a freak hurricane and his ship sinks. Bobadilla drowns. And even without Columbus, Spanish slave raids, military campaigns, slave raiding, and old world diseases just destroy the peoples of the Carib. I mean, you can see, you know, these continual attacks. The Spanish actually step up and increase their attacks on the Native Americans with the departure of Christopher Columbus. Uh, the Taino and the Caribs com completely collapse. You can see the demographic decline right up above me. There was roughly two to three million Taino and Carib in 1492. Uh, and only, you know, 20 years later, the population just completely crashes as they start enslaving these people in large numbers, as these old world diseases are unleashed on the Native Americans. By 1550, the population of the Taino and the Carib go from three million to zero goose egg. By 1550, the entire Native American population of the Caribbean has been effectively annihilated. This is why people charge Christopher Columbus with genocide. Columbus is in prison. He returns to Spain, 1500. He's jailed for six weeks. He spends six weeks <laughs> chained to a wall. Uh, his wealth is seized. His titles are stripped from him. And during that time, the sort of the Italian faction in the New World is completely broken up. All the Italians are sent back. And the effort in the New World is now purely Spanish. Uh, but Columbus in prison poses a difficult legal problem for the two Spanish monarchs. Uh, because he was named Lord Admiral. And if they actually do end up charging Columbus with all of these crimes that Bobadilla recommends it's going to make them look bad because they're the one that put him there. So eventually they come to an agreement. They come to Columbus and they say, okay, okay, we're going to make a deal with you. Columbus can get gets all his money back. And he did make an enormous fortune selling slaves uh, in Spain and North Africa. Columbus gets his money back. Uh, and we drop all the charges against Columbus. But... Columbus is going to surrender all his claims to the New World, 
and he's going to surrender his title of Lord Admiral of the Oceans. And Columbus says, well, for one thing, I can't surrender any titles to the New World because it's not a New World. Columbus refuses to admit that Amerigo Vespucci is correct. Columbus says, no, I found the lands of the Indies. I found, we just haven't found China yet. That's the problem. And the Spanish monarchs are like, oh my God, this guy. Okay, okay. You get your money back. We let you out of prison, but you surrender all your titles to whatever you found on the other side of the ocean. Columbus says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that if you fund one last voyage and I know I'm going to find China this time. And the Spanish monarch's like, oh God, okay. Just give it to him. Just, just give it to him. Just give it to him and maybe he'll go away. And that's what they do. So here's the deal that's, that's reached. Columbus gets let out of prison. He gets his huge, he gets his enormous fortune back and he gets a fourth voyage of discovery but in return, he's got to give up all the claims to the New World. Columbus agrees to this. And this is the fourth voyage of Columbus. And it's right above my head. It's the, it's the arrow in green. Columbus leaves, absolutely convinced he's going to find Spain. He sails around the Caribbean. No, absolutely convinced he's going to find China and Japan. Uh, he sails around the Caribbean. He's asking people where the Chinese emperor is. Uh, he's like, where's the way to Japan? We need to find porcelain, silk, cardamom. And the Native Americans are, are just like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Nobody here speaks Chinese. And he does encounter one of the great civilizations of the New World uh, off the coast of uh, off the coast of modern day uh, Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, he finds, uh, you know, a Maya merchant with his huge canoe full of cool stuff. But like, there's no silk, there's no cardamom. There's this stuff that the natives really treasure called tobacco, but Columbus doesn't know what that is. And Columbus is very desperate. He's, he's in his 50s. He's very sick. His time in prison was, didn't help him. Uh, and then he's actually caught in a hurricane off the, south, off the coast of one of these islands, off, off the coast of an island that today we call Jamaica. And Columbus's entire exploration fleet is shipwrecked. It's, it's smashed, and this is the end of Columbus's fourth voyage. Uh, the ship, all, all the ships are crashed onto the coast of Jamaica. They stagger ashore. They kind of re recover what's left of their ships and they build this little fort. The Indians keep attacking them. And Columbus has to face the ultimate humiliation of sending a messenger back to the Castilian faction of his old colonies because they've got to come save him because he's shipwrecked off the coast of Jamaica. Uh, and the Castilians in these like squalid colonies that he founded, the, the Spaniards are like, Columbus, really? We got to save this guy? This, this is horrible, horrible Italian. We already said all these. I thought the guy was supposed to be in prison. So the Spanish actually agree, okay, we're going to go save Columbus. But they wait a year to do it. They leave him on that island in Jamaica for a year. Uh, and then they do finally save him. They bring him back to Hispaniola. They load him on a boat. They're like, don't talk to us. And they send him back to Spain. Uh, and Columbus is just, Columbus gets back to Spain. And by 1506, Columbus is in bad health. He spent a year shipwrecked on an, on the, on an, an island. He's, he was in prison. Everyone hates him. Uh, he is utterly humiliated and, and disgraced. He didn't find India, even though he claims on his deathbed, he found the way to China. His reputation is in complete and total tatters. No one wants anything to do with Christopher Columbus. This is why even late in his life, nobody painted a picture of Columbus. Everybody wanted to forget Christopher Columbus. But Christopher Columbus has a very, very faithful son, Ferdinand Columbus. Uh, Ferdinand Columbus inherited the enormous fortune that his father made selling Native American slaves. And he basically proceeds to take this huge fortune of his father and becomes one of the leading scholars in Europe. He builds the largest library in Europe. And he collects all of these rare books. He builds this enormous library. And one of the things that Ferdinand Columbus decides to do is salvage the reputation of his father. And he writes a book. Life of the Admiral by his son, and he publishes this in 1535. And this is where we get this idea of Columbus the hero from, because 
you know, Ferdinand Columbus's history uh, of, of Columbus is glowing. It talks about what a genius he is. It talks about how religious he was. It talked about how he knew his destiny lay on the other side of the ocean. Now, one of the important things that happens between 1506 and 1535 is Cortez conquers the Aztec Empire. And suddenly the New World, suddenly huge ships of gold and silver start to come from Mexico. And the New World actually starts to pay off, pay off like in spades by uh, 1535. So Ferdinand Columbus goes, this time is right to revive, to, to save the reputation of my father. And Ferdinand Columbus does this. Uh, Life of the Admiral talks about Columbus as a hero. He's an intrepid explorer. He was a genius at navigation. He was incredibly good at sailing. He knew his destiny lay across the ocean. God wanted him to cross the ocean and bring the Holy Mother Catholic Church to these heathen savages in the New World. Really, really, Christopher Columbus crossed the ocean guided by the hand of the Almighty himself. But again, historiography. Can we believe what Ferdinand Columbus writes about his father? Did Ferdinand Columbus have an ulterior motive? Do other texts agree or disagree with uh, the life of the Admiral by his son? And this is why we have two entirely different narratives about Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, the intrepid hero, guided by God, destined to create America, and Christopher Columbus, this brutal conqueror who gave women to his, his men to rape, who sold girls into slavery, who set people on fire, fed people to dogs. These two incredibly divergent narratives, and there's almost no middle ground that could be reached. It's, it's a very clever argument that tries to thread the needle between these very divergent narratives about Christopher Columbus. Now, in the 21st century today, there are a number of states that have, that have said we should not celebrate Columbus Day. Uh, and there they are right up above my head. A number of states have renamed Columbus Day, not to honor Christopher Columbus, but to honor Native Americans, the indigenous people of the Americas, the first American nations themselves. And they've renamed it Indigenous People's Day. Uh, and some states have like done both. And like Oklahoma, like, eh, why not both? Um, and uh, they've, they've said, no, we shouldn't celebrate Columbus Day. We should celebrate our, our Native American contribution, the Native American contribution to our culture. We should refuse Columbus Day. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether we should replace Columbus Day or not, or whether we should have Indigenous Peoples Day or not. I'm going to leave that up to you. But if somebody did give me a magic wand, if somebody said, all right, Keith, make a decision about Columbus Day, um, I, would, I would go with the 16th century solution. I would say, let's do what the 16th century did. Let's try and forget Columbus existed. And let's embrace the guy who didn't enslave millions of people. Amerigo Vespucci, Captain America himself. And this is why in the 16th century, they, they celebrated not Christopher Columbus for discovering the new world, but Amerigo Vespucci. This is why they called it North and South America and not North and South Colombia. Captain America. If I had a magic wand, I would say, Let's have America Day and celebrate Amerigo Vespucci. He's still Italian, so you, you can still do the Italian thing. Yeah, Amerigo Vespucci. He wrote crazy letters. You now have all the information you need to answer that question right there. Was Christopher Columbus an intrepid explorer who created America or a genocidal conqueror responsible for theft slavery and genocide. Use the information from this lecture to build and support a thesis that argues one way or the other. Use all four of the historical texts that I've briefly described to you. Or you want to create a third narrative that kind of threads that needle? Go right ahead. And finally, using your argument, should Columbus Day be celebrated? And you should have an answer to that building in your head. And we're going to meet these Native Americans. We're going to meet the people that Christopher Columbus encountered in the New World in the next lecture. And I will see you there.